I'm Alberto Godenzi, the Dean of the School of Social Work at Boston College, and it is my real privilege and honor to introduce today's keynote speaker of our Race and Justice Conference, Superintendent Chief William Gross. The topic of community policing, or more general relationships between police and communities, and the aspect of social justice has emerged as an issue of national importance since the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, August 9, 2014. But of course, tensions in the relationship between police and communities, and specifically between police and communities of color, are not a new phenomenon. In fact, given the stakes and the distribution of power, they seem to be inevitable. Having said that, I think it is fair to say that we here in Boston have been really lucky in recent years to have such distinguished police leadership in Commissioner Bill Evans and Chief Gross. Reporting directly to the police commissioner, the superintendent in chief is the highest ranking police officer in the department. The superintendent in chief is responsible for the development, review, evaluation and recommendation to the police commissioner of policies, procedures, and programs necessary to ensure the implementation of community policing and the effective delivery of police services to the public. Now, as you have maybe seen when Superintendent Chief Gross walked into the room, he knows a lot of people here. That is not a coincidence. Chief Gross is a 32-year veteran of the Boston Police Department. As a patrol officer, he spent many years in the gang unit and drug control unit, and also was an ac academy instructor. In 2004, he was promoted to sergeant, and in 2006 was rated a sergeant detective. The majority of these supervisor years were spent in District C11, Dorchester. In 2008, Police Commissioner Edward Davis promoted William to the deputy superintendent at which time he became a member of the command staff of the department. For the next two and a half years, he was the commander of Zone 2, which is comprised of Area B2, Roxbury and Mission Hill, Area B3, Mattapan, Area C11, Dorchester, and Area C6, South Boston. In this role, he coordinated with the district captains in their development of strategies to address crime trends and attended community meetings to address specific neighborhood crime concerns. In 2010, he was appointed as the commander of the Field Support Division, which included command over the Youth Violence Strike Force Gang Unit and the School Police Unit. Chief Gross was promoted in 2012 to Superintendent Night Commander. In 2014, Chief Gross was selected by Police Commissioner William Evans to be the Superintendent-in-Chief of the Department, the first African-American Chief in the history of the Boston Police Department. Throughout Chief Gross' career, he has maintained a strong connection with the community and has been awarded numerous awards for bravery, meritorious service, and community partnerships. It's a real privilege to have you here, Chief Gross, and I look forward to your conversation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Dean, thank you, thank you very much for having me here. I'm always willing to share um, my life's experiences, both um, at work and from the hood, as I said. <laughs> it's a good thing. I understand there's some award recipients here today as well, so congratulations to you as well. And I really am honored to be here and to, to discuss community policing, social justice, because with effective communication become positive and effective changes. And I think us convening here like this, it just carries on because we all pass what we learn and what we communicate to each other, we pass that forward. And yes, I do know some folks in the audience, but that's good, now I'll know who's throwing things at me. <laughs> Monica from Darnell. 
So where do we begin? I would begin with a little bit of history about myself. I hail from Hillsborough, Maryland. I came here in 1975. Right there? All right. Crab cakes. Mm. <laughs> I, came, I came here in 1975 at the age of 12. And the reason I'm giving um, my biology, so to speak, is because it's very important coming from a farming community to Boston in 1975, what did I arrive to? Forced busing. You can't go here, you can't go there, because people don't like you. So at 12, I come here, and it's like, wow, what the hell's wrong with people? You know, I, I, I don't get it. But then, too, you know, I always wanted to be a police officer, a football player, or a fighter pilot, but I can't fit in a jet, so I took police officer. <laughs> so I'm like, wow. Growing up in Dorchester, Esmond Street, in 1975, what an eye-opener and, and what a change. But from that, I learned something that carried through till now to my career, about partnerships, about not forgetting where you came from, and that's this. When I arrived in Dorchester, it's my mother, my two sisters, older, younger, and single parent, tough neighborhood, but a tough neighborhood with good people, some bad. And I like to say, I was raised by my parents. The other parents were Vietnam vets, nosy Miss Parker in the window, <laughs> some of the hustlers. I learned from everybody in that neighborhood. And also, I learned from everyone in the neighborhood about acceptability in Boston, about relationships with not only other communities, but how you're perceived, how you may be stereotyped, or how we may stereotype others. But one of the biggest things was what was the relationship in 1975 betwixt, she loves that word. She's like, don't use it, you sound country. I am country. <laughs> so, but what was the relationship like? I always keep it real. The relationship was kind of adversarial at best between communities of color and the Boston Police Department. Generation, generationally, it had been an Irish police department. And from my neighborhoods where you know, I grew up and interacted with, it just wasn't a good relationship. But as well, um, I knew people that wanted to be police officers, but they just, hey, you're not welcome. You know, um, there was Massachusetts Association of Afro-American Police Officers that had to sue the department just for gangs to, to be promoted, to be a police officer. So all that filters right back to the community. Like, wow, do these folks really care about you if you have to sue them for you to even get on the department? Or if you're on the department, you have to put in a lawsuit to get promoted. That starts talk in the neighborhoods, that starts perceptions, negative perceptions, hardly anything positive. So imagine myself, like, wow, I want to be a police officer. And my friends are like, you're crazy. Are you kidding me? But I believe this as well. Everybody in this country is responsible for building this country historically. And that's everyone, from Native Americans to African Americans, everybody that comes to this great melting pot. So with that being said, nobody owes me anything, but I have a right to do whatever I want because everyone helped build this country, so you have a right to it. So um, I was instilled with that sense of history and self-worth from my parents. Notice, again, parents. It's people from the community and my mother. So, I really did concentrate on becoming a police officer. So much so, when I graduated Boston Technical High School in 1982, I went straight to the police department the next year in an apprenticeship program, um, the Boston Police Cadets. Took the police exam and came on 1985 as a police officer, hitting the streets at 21. So what did that look like, 1985? What did I bring along from me from the proverbial hood that everyone stereotyped that everybody's bad, what did I bring to me to a police force and what did that police force look like? So, 
I brought with me a lot of questions. I'm a white kid all day. And thank God there were some folks there that in the, in the police administrations asked tough questions. What do you feel about Jim Crow laws? What do you feel about current race relations? What do you think about me being on the job? Will I ever be allowed to go to a higher level? And some were quite honestly, they're like, I don't think so at this time. And some were like, hey, you can do anything you want. But never forget where you come from and learn to deal with people. Treat them as, as you would want to be treated. When you put on the uniform and you go out, you're wielding a lot of power. And when you go back to a neighborhood where you came from that thought you were crazy for even joining the police department in the first place, you have to show that you remember history, both negative and positive, and that you're willing to make a change, even when you're taking a lot of heat. I've been called Uncle Tom. I've been called sellout. From other sides, I've been called the N-word. But either way, when you put this uniform on and you're serving the public, you have to be willing to listen and make effective changes. That was tough in 1985 because the culture of policing then was to respond to a call, take a report, see you later. Maybe a detective will follow up. Follow up. You didn't really interact with the public unless you were there on a call. There was a little bit of community policing in the form of what we call the footbeat cop. But because we were receiving so many calls, technology, technology kind of changed the relationship. I mean, more calls, we have to get there quicker. So everybody goes into cars, into wagons, on motorcycles, and there's hardly any interaction with the public. If you don't interact with the neighborhoods on a consistent basis, then you begin to think that you know how to make changes without their input. In 1985, that was, that was pretty much it. We respond to the calls. We were taught that, we were even taught that in the academy. Get to the call, move on to the next one. Make as many, as a, uh, many arrests as you can. That's how you're going to get the bad guys off the street, and that's how you're going to change the neighborhood. But then one thing happened. The big crack epidemic. Moved from New York to Boston. No one even heard what that was. We're used to making cocaine arrests heroin, weed, <laughs> but crack, these little bumps of white substance, I'm like, what the hell is that? But it was very addictive. In the beginning, when they sold crack, it was in glass vials filled to the top just to get people hooked. And within a year, that glass vial went down to one little piece of crack in aluminum foil. And then from there, one little piece of crack into like saran wrap. But either way, it hit us all hard in Boston because it transcended any, any class, lower, middle, upper, crack was everywhere. And what was happening, and I'm talking from the police culture and in the city, we were kind of losing that drug war because everybody was in their individual silos. The police, again, did not really have a great relationship with the communities. So in the later 80s, there was a concept of community policing. And then you went into the 90s, from 1990 to 1994, there were 40 to 60 teenagers being killed every year on the street. And everyone's like, what are we going to do? And trust me, everybody was fighting each other. Even the reverends were fighting each other. See, I speak the truth. Some people <laughs> wouldn't say that, like, what are you doing? <laughs> Reverends were fighting, community members were fighting, everybody was fighting. Um, everyone needed to kind of get it together, get out of your individual silos, and work against that common enemy, that crack addiction, and all that it brings with it. The gang wars. wars. <laughs> gang wars, shootings, innocent victims, kids being caught up by the predators that were using them to deal drugs. People selling their bodies, their kids, themselves. It was ridiculous. But again, we were losing that war. 1990 to 94, all those teenagers being murdered. But in 1994, highest homicide rate ever in Boston. And folks were like, hey, it's time to wake up. 
Ten Point Coalition was formed. Reverend, stop fighting. Let's go. Let's save the neighborhood. BPD, let's really concentrate on community policing. Our community partners, hey, what's your input? Because, you know, our officers are making a hell of a lot of arrests, but it's not affecting anything, nothing. So clergy, police, city hall, that system of government, and the people from the community finally came together to work. And in the next year, look it up, here's your homework assignments, the Boston Miracle Year. Oh, this is a miracle. That simple thing about getting your opinion, what do you think, who's really dealing the drugs, and what families need help, all of those ideals, all of those communications betwixt each other. <laughs> um, I did that just for you, for real. That really paid off. We really learned the benefits of, of, of community policing, and it paid off. And it all starts with communication and believability. Speaking to the dean a little bit earlier, it's like, hey, when you have conversations with people in communities, you have to tell it like it is, and you have to be sincere, or there's no believability, and you will get nothing done. So that's how it was earlier, but 1995, Everyone realized when you work together, you can make changes. I have, to, I have to also say we had help from Washington because funding is a lot too. If you don't work together, show folks what you need and that you're working together, sometimes the federal government's like, hey, I have nothing to give you. But we receive funding, but more importantly, with that funding, we continue to talk. From 1995 to 2015 to now, all we did, folks, was simply keep those relationships going because it was a tough sell. Anything you read, you talk to people from communities. It was a tough sell. How do you go from a police department that has a history of dealing with neighborhoods of color, and we know 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, Rodney King, um, a black man beating, being beaten, on City Hall Plaza with a flagpole. How do you go to convincing that neighborhood that, hey, now we're into community policing and we want your input? It was a tough sell. How do you go from a macho culture, Clint Eastwood, Bronson, let's go get the bad guys, I'll tell you what to do, I know what's good for you. How do you go from that to community policing? It was a tough sell, and thank God there were a lot of people with a lot of patience that hung in there and changed both cultures. So again, from 1995 till now, we have built some solid relationships and we have kept things going. How does that look now? Now, we are the number one community policing model in the country, as touted by President Obama. Does that mean you rest on your laurels and that like, hey, we're number one and you don't do anything? Wrong. You constantly learn from your partners in the community. This is a great woman right there, Monica. We kind of live in a war zone at times, right? Right. Right? She called me. I don't know what kind of services she had before. I'm like, hey, we're here to listen. Let's go. Let's solve it together. Darnell right there. One of the best men out in the field. I didn't forget you, you as well. But this is what it takes. It takes everybody from the village doing their job. It takes everyone willing to make a change. And along with that, there's a huge accountability piece. If you can't handle that, you're in the wrong line of work. If you can't handle const constructive criticism and criticism, you're in the wrong line of work. But proud to say that I think we're doing a pretty good job. But when I say we, it's not just the Boston Police Department. It's everybody in the community now. Because that mistrust from 1995, here in Boston, I think we've come a long way when compared to other major metropolises in our great nation. She loves that one, too. <laughs> it's not great for everyone, I know. Um, we're, we're doing pretty well because you saw Ferguson, but before that, Trayvon Martin, Staten Island, Ferguson, 
South Carolina was just ridiculous. All of them were ridiculous. I think we showed in Boston that we were willing to listen to people and how they felt and not be dismissive. When people protested here, even from Occupy Boston, you didn't see us being over-militarized. You didn't see the riot helmets. You didn't see the sticks. And especially after what took place in Ferguson, that was a teachable moment for us, by the way. But when people protested, you didn't see us with the bear cats. You didn't see us in right gear. You saw us on the front lines talking to the protesters, listening to everyone. Was it tough? Some people came there with um, just a mindset of, of ignorance. You wanted to have dialogue? Nope, I don't want to talk to your police officer. You're all alike. I'm like, no, no, we're not. Not in Boston. For instance, on the front line, protesters are trying to get to the expressway. I have a line of officers, state police and Boston police, standing right there. I'm like, no, you're not going on the expressway. Not meant for people. You'll get hurt. But people were shocked to see who was standing right next to me. I had the NAACP standing next to me, Brother Supreme and another brother. I was like, nope, you don't have to go anywhere. Stand right here. You'll see how the officers treat people. So when those false accusations came in later, police were abusive. They beat me. How about this? The NAACP sticking up for a police department? Like, nope, I was right there with them. Any protest that we had in Boston, we either had a member of the clergy there, a member of the community, NAACP, Urban League, close at hand, right by us. That's true partnership. That's everybody in the, in the community stepping up to show that Boston is not like other cities and towns that are having trouble. Of course, we do have some issues, but not people using the ignorance of destruction, destroying a town, burning it to make a point. In Boston, we believe in the First Amendment. You have a right to protest. Or I wouldn't be here as the first African-American chief. And that's what I told people quite simply that were the organizers of protests. Like, hey, do your thing. But don't forget who taught everyone how to protest peacefully after they learned from the tenets of Gandhi. And that's Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And he studied here in Boston. So let's honor that. So please use your voices of logic and not the ignorance of destruction. And again, I think we did pretty well. The officers, a lot of patience. But out of that, a lot of discussion. What's going on in Ferguson, Staten Island, South Carolina? How do you feel about that? We weren't just having those discussions with ourselves. We were having those discussions, discussions with people in the community. More importantly, the youth of the community. I remember being in Dewey Square, and two young women came up to me. She's like, Chief, where do we go now? I was like, well, OK, where do you go now? I've been out here for 30 years. I've definitely seen the horrors of black-on-black -black crime and mistrust between the police and what's going on in Ferguson. I said, but thank God in my era, I didn't see that. But we used to have riots because of civil unrest in the latter 60s. And I said, I don't think we want that now. But us working together, we can make a change. So I'm like, but what are you going to do now? I said, you're protesting here now, but look around you. You have some people here with you that think this is just, hey, I'm black for a day, I'm cool with everyone, and then they go back to the suburbs. But you're going back to the neighborhoods, but now you have a voice. You have people that are going to listen. So what are you going to do? So that conversation with two individuals turned into six, to 20, to 50. And then the news came in. What's going on? Are they all left yelling at the chief? No. I'm like, no. You know, you guys need to back off. We're having a conversation about what we're going to do next. And I'm very proud to say, as I looked around this group, African American, Latino, Cabo Verde, Caucasian, that young generation was kind of sticking together. It's pretty cool. And, and even cooler than that to me is when I told them to take a pause for five seconds. So like, why? I'm like, just look around. But why? Stop being the white generation, just look around, right? <laughs> so they looked around. I said, what did you see? I don't know, what do you, what, we're all here. I said, is anything burning? 
No. Anything broken? No. Anything stolen? No. I'm like, good. You're really honoring Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Now people will listen to you. Because if you act, I mean, people do things to bring attention to themselves and they have their own reasons. I say, but ignorance of destruction, no one will listen to why you're doing what you do because all they'll see is destruction and that'll prompt them to think of you in stereotypical terms. Look, they're destroying their own community. Look, they don't care about dialogue. Look, here we go again. So I'm very proud of the protesters in Boston. Those, again, that uses, use their voices of logic and not the ignorance of destruction. Because that showcased what we were doing here in Boston and brought attention to 25 years of hard work to become the number one community policing model. That model where you listen to people and find out what you need. That model where you know that arresting all the problems, I mean, arresting everyone won't solve problems. That relationship where you find true partners, Angel Perry, you know I was going to give you the big shout out, where you can truly rely on them to help problem solve together. I don't know if you folks know about Youth Connect, but how about this? BPD is comprised of about 2,145 officers this time. We have 11 police districts, not including the specialized units. But that model of community policing in those 11 districts we have 11 community service offices now with officers that believe in community policing and believe that in problem solving together. One of the things that we're most proud of is, back to you can't arrest the problems away. How about helping out families? How about in four of our busiest districts, Roxbury, Mattapan, Dorchester, the South End, two of our specialized units that are very busy, the gang unit and school police unit, we have clinical social workers. How about Angela Perry that led the way? When you first came into that police station, it was like, eh, eh. But we learned that partnerships work. You can't even touch them in the police station. You can't say anything negative. I, I can't tell you from being on the police department in 1985, where we're like, hey, that's your problem now. We locked his ass up, you go. Right? <laughs> Sorry, potty mouth sometimes. Those are your coaches. But um, to now where you see young officers bringing kids at risk to Angela and her staffs and her colleagues' attention, or kids that have been arrested. Let's go to Youth Connect. You help that family. And how about this? The community knows that Youth Connect is not acting as our agent. They're not telling, hey, Gang drugs, hey, the guns here, the drugs are here, and da da. No, sincerely helping the family so that when they go back into the neighborhoods, hopefully they don't have to commit crime because you've identified resources for them to help them out. How about true community partners like Monica? Get off that phone, right? <laughs> that will come and tell you like it is. But you might think very little of what I just said. She'll come and tell me like it is. Why is that important? Here's why. What about if you have witnessed a time, some are older than me, <laughs> where if you're a member of a community and you wanted to voice your opinion about poor services or you wanted to give ideas, if you wanted to give constructive criticism, you had to worry about retaliation from the police. Again, I'll talk about stuff that some people don't want you to talk about, but that's important. It shows where we were then and where we are now. Monica has called me several times. Darnell has called me several times. You have called me several times. Hey, we think you need to do this better, and why aren't you doing this, and why aren't you doing that? Some of the things we can explain, like, okay, we tried this, we tried this, and we tried this, but we can do this together. But how about that, folks? You're coming from a past, negative history that some people are like, you know what, that's how it is. You can't talk to them. They don't care about us. To now where, again, 11 districts, 11 community service offices, and trust me, we hear it every day. But trust me, we hear it every day as well. It's like, hey, we think you're doing a good job. So again, constructive criticism, good. 
and um, working together even better. I'd like to tell you about some of the programs, just to brag about the partnerships that were instrumental in us becoming a very positive community policing force. 1995, we started some programs and initiatives with the people in the community. One was ceasefire, where you bring gang members in one side at a time. It's like, hey, Lucerne, we know what you're doing. You, we know what you're doing. It's not anonymous to us. And then here comes the partnership, folks. We bring them in, usually to a courtroom, carrot and stick approach. They hear from the BPD, they hear from the district attorney's office, and they hear from the U.S. attorneys. And they hear that if you continue doing what you do, the shootings, the stabbings, the drug dealings, you could end up here, state level or federal level, level in Kansas where nobody's going to visit you. Or more importantly to you, you could be dead, your young life wasted. And we had pictures of gang members that were deceased. We wanted to bring that point to home. But partnership, also in that room, the next person up, clergy from the neighborhood. I was telling these gang members, like, listen, I've had, I buried over 300 of your friends from the community. One reverend to this day, Reverend Jeffrey Brown's had like over 1,500. But we're bringing that point home. That now, the police department, judicial system is working with the clergy, and we had city services there too to provide jobs, um, continue your education. So that was very beneficial. Those ceasefires, they really worked. And now that, that model is being used across the country to this day. Also, we came on board with the probation department. Before, if you had conditions to your probation, you report to your probation officer at the court in bet between the hours of 9 to 5. After that, you could do whatever you wanted. But then we started working with the probation department in, in Operation Nightlight. Surprise, we're here. Where are you? Or surprise, you're, we're here. Why is that gun there and why are the drugs there? That really helped. But here's another one that really shocked people. Operation Homefront, where your kids in the street, at risk or gang involved, whatever happens in the streets transcends into the school system, right? Then we have mandated reporters that can be in any form, like, hey, you better help this kid, or hey, this kid's doing this and this kid's doing that. And we've all heard people in the neighborhoods, like, somebody should do something. Where the hell are the parents? Don't they know what's going on? So we worked in partnership with the clergy to ensure that the parents knew what was going on. So here's what we did. Teamed up with clergy and we would visit that household. Here's the number one thing. You can't go into communities, right, that are having a tough time and come in there like this. You ought to, and don't you know, and blah, blah, blah. You don't do that. What you do is educate them as to what's going on in their child's life and do you know about it when you're on your second job? Do you know about it when you're struggling with family members that are drug dependent and you have your hands full and you don't get to pay enough attention to the kid because reality is reality. Maybe you're too busy, you have all these responsibilities, so you may miss something with the kid. They're sure not gonna bring their negative behavior to your face. So you go in with an educational visit and you go in to provide resources. And I would say this, if you say you're gonna do something, you have to be able to back it up and provide it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was being done. Because again, the onus wasn't solely on the police department. We weren't the panacea for everything, from socioeconomics, to floods, to electricity. Trust me, we used to get playing with everything. So it's good for us to finally have partners that's like, hey, Man, you care too? That we can make a difference? I don't have to just put the cuffs on everyone? So those programs, man, and then you come forward and you have Youth Connect. So you're at the point where you have clinical social workers in the station, and then everyone sees that. And, so, and you know, then you have big corporations come in. John Hancock, Fidelity, 
Target, Macy's, all partnering up with us. Police, private sector, and the community working together. That's how you do it. And in Boston, we have been doing that for a long time. But again, we're kind of fine-tuning everything. And what I alluded to earlier about the protests and things that were happening in other parts of our nation, those are teachable moments for us. Because trust me, we hear it from the community. Are you like that? Are you guys all alike? No. Really, well, let's have a dialogue. A group, teen empowerment. We want to have a dialogue about Ferguson. Let's go. We want to have a dialogue about Staten Island. We want to have a dialogue. Let's go. When residents from the community is like, hey, you know what? We're going to do our part. We're going to have a community day. We're going to have a cookout. Right? In those, we're going to have informational tables where we can show people that they can do things differently. People take notice of that. Our good doings here are being passed on, not only in this country, but to other countries. For the last two years, we've had over 20 visitors from foreign countries that want to know how Boston is doing what they do. And we never, we, the Boston police, ever say, I did this and I did this. We always say, we did this and we did this. And I give them the history, the commissioner gives them the history, and you do have believability because the commissioner, a poor white kid from Southie, and the chief, a poor black kid from Dorchester. That when the chief got here in 1975, these two probably wouldn't have been talking. Might have been a little exchange of rock throwing and, and verbal <laughs> abuse back and forth. But that, too, shows where we're at. People always look at myself and the commissioner everywhere we go and how we interact with each other because they know the history the negative history, and they're like, hmm, Southie and Dorchester, how's this going to turn out? <laughs> and then they get a good laugh when I say, hey, he's trying to get me to run, I'm trying to get him to eat. Right? <laughs> and even better, and he'll say, and, I, and I'll do his voice probably on camera, oh, hey. He's like, That's okay, Willie. When we walk down the street, we look like the number 10. Right? <laughs> But what's so cool about that? Do you realize that interaction, that exchange, shows people that Boston has changed? That two people that probably met in 1975, there would have been a strong potential that we'd be adversarial just because where we came from, how we believed about each, what we believed about each other's culture and interaction. Two people that grew up poor that the community helped raise them. Two people that are willing to make sacrifices about their egos, that you're not macho this and that, put things aside, help people, talk to people, and forget about the cuffs for a while. People need to see that because of the negative history in Boston. Even I, when I go to community meetings, right, and I have talks, especially with the kids, and they know history, and they're thinking we're like Ferguson, Staten Island, South Carolina, like, listen, even as a black chief, I own all the negative history of the BPD. What do you mean? You weren't there then. It doesn't matter. I own all of the negative history in the face of the department. What do you mean by that? All that means is, is that I guarantee you that myself and the commissioner will remind you of the negative history and that those moments in time are teachable moments that teach us how to move forward and to learn from that so we'll never, ever go back there again. And good, when you acknowledge it, people like to hear it because there is nothing worse than when you have gone through a negative experience that has affected your family and your community, whether you're black, white, or purple, there is nothing worse than like, hey, that wasn't me, that happened years ago. And you dismiss that pain and you dis dismiss what they've gone through. But when you stand up, I'm like, yes, that did happen, but here's where we're at now. Here's what we're doing now. And when you educate folks, am I in trouble? Am I getting towed? <laughs> okay, I gotta go. I gotta wrap it up, folks. 
I apologize. I will come back, but we have an officer shot, and I have to go. And um, unfortunately, I have to go. But you have some good folks that will tell you like it is. I would just say this in closing. God bless you all. You're here, and you're going to pass it forward to how it's so important to work together. And it's so important to stay together and work on issues and never, ever, ever be negative. Please stay positive. Uh, positive. Again, I apologize, but i got to go. Okay, I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, what a remarkable individual. Um, I just met him and I used to work in the prisons and he told me last week he was at MCI Norfolk talking about restorative justice uh, with inmates and what did I think about it and what did he, how did he think that went with the inmates. And uh, again, Judith and I worked in the prisons way back. Uh, that would not have happened back in the 80s when, uh, when we were doing our work. So. Uh, uh, I'm sorry he wasn't able to stay and take some questions, but uh, hopefully we'll get him back. All right. Now, uh, I have the privilege of uh, introducing two of our distinguished alumni who will give their reflections and response to uh, Superintendent Gross's comments. Melanie Robinson Finlay, after graduating, began working at the Suffolk County House of Correction, where she now serves as the mental health director. Melanie and her team provide individual and group therapy, crisis intervention, and overall support during what may be the most vulnerable moments of offenders' lives. Andrea Perry is the executive director of Youth Connect, a program that places social workers inside Boston police stations to provide police-referred young people with comprehensive clinical services. Andrea has over 20 years of direct service, experience with at-risk youth working with the Boston Public Schools, Juvenile Court Clinic, Teen Parenting Program, and a member of an on-call trauma response team. She's also an adjunct member of our faculty. Both Melanie and Andrea approach their important work with deep respect for the dignity and people they serve, and with the belief that each encounter with a client offers an opportunity to advance recovery from the cumulative effects of violence, poverty, and oppression. So let us begin with Melanie's response. Um, most people wonder why anybody would want to work in corrections. Um, why you'd want to be in a jail with doors locking behind you and not able to get out. Um, but I think once you get there, you realize how dynamic the work is and how it's like nothing else that anybody will ever experience in life. You get to meet people at a very vulnerable time, but you get to see them grow in that time. And you get to be a part of their narrative in a way that you never thought possible. Um, People regard inmates as being people who can't be redeemed. They're, they don't get any better. They can't get any help. They're a waste of time and energy and the resources that are given to them. And that is the further thing from the truth. They're actually people who have a right, as Superintendent Gross said, to opportunity. And they have a want for opportunity. And they have a want for difference and change. When they get out, they come back to your community. They come back to my community. They come back to our community. And if we don't do something while they're at that moment to help them get out and get better, then we're really doing ourselves an injustice. Um, one of the great things about working at the Suffolk County House of Correction right now is that we're working with a sheriff who actually aligns with the social work missions. He's, his statement is always, we're not here to warehouse individuals. We're not here to punish people. We're here to help them rehabilitate. So he has started programs now that give these guys and the women real opportunities for jobs when they get out. So he started a tailoring program. We have a culinary arts program. We have a family matters program now, which actually works with their children that are left behind and their moms or dads or whichever, or grandmothers, whoever's raising the kid to help them get child care or other services that they need um, so the children can be taken care of. We have um, a workforce development manager who actually goes out to Target and Lowe's and all these places, builds relationships with them so that these guys can get jobs when they get out despite having a quarry. Um, we are actually really working hard to make sure that these gentlemen and these women come back and they actually have a chance to do better than what was given to them before. And that's really the important part of our work and that's the part that makes coming to work every day great because we never know what's going to happen. We don't know what success we're going to have. 
one of our jobs as mental health clinicians is we work a lot with community providers. Um, we actually had an inmate who left recently who was in crisis and called us and said, I really need help. And by the grace of God that I know Cindy Gordon at BMC, she allowed me to, she allowed help for him. She, I called her and I said, we have this issue. I really need this guy to be seen. What can we do? And she was able to help us facilitate that. That's the work that we do. And that man actually said to me, thank you so much. You're working miracles for me. And I said to him, this is why this team comes to work every day. And he says, but not everybody does that. Some people just come for their paycheck. Nobody on the mental health team at that jail, and I can't speak for everybody who works at the jail, but the people on the mental health team <laughs> definitely come because they really want to be there and they really want to foster a change. Um, and I think that's one of the better things about what we do, that these people get to get their GEDs. They get to really do things that they didn't really have the ability to do in the community. Sometimes this is their first time getting medical care. Sometimes it's their first time actually talking to somebody. Luckily, the team is made up of mostly women, so they can play like, oh, I just wanted to see a girl, so I'm just going to talk to her. But in actuality, they're coming and they're crying and they're begging and they're pleading for help. They're begging to think better and to do better. And we can't always help them the way we want to. A lot of times we go home feeling like today was a waste, like what did we really do? Until we get the call from the person who's left and says, you were the only person who helped me. Until their mom or their wife or their husband calls and says, this person really said that you helped when they were there and they need help now. What can you do for them? And that's the dynamics of social work and corrections. Um, so I'm going to take a slightly different spin. I graduated uh, with my MSW in 1999. I think I'm one of those rare people. My first job out of grad school is where I still am today. Um, we had a different name then, um, but I remember seeing um, a posting in the uh, Massachusetts chapter of the NASW newsletter in print. There was no online searching then. Um, and I saw this posting that said, social worker in a police station in Boston. And I said, this is my job. Um, this is the intersect of my life. Um, some folks know, a lot of folks don't know. My father was a police officer in Connecticut. I've been around law enforcement my whole entire life. Um, and growing up in Connecticut as a black woman with a father who was a police officer who rose the ranks to be the head of the state police, um, to be the colonel in the Connecticut State Police, I've seen this topic played out over, I won't say how old I am, but my whole entire life. Um, so being the face, similar to uh, Chief Gross, being the face of the state police, um, we were sued um, because he rejected people in the academy. We were threatened by the KKK um, because the Klan is alive and it is in Connecticut um, because he was the highest ranking black man in the department. Um, and that's a hard thing to wrap your head around when you're 10, um, that your father is going to protect people's right to protest, um, but yet the people who are protesting and the people who are opposing the protesters, um, one of them wants to shoot and kill your father. Um, and everybody's like, you're going to grow up and be in law enforcement. I was like, I have no desire to be in law enforcement whatsoever, whatsoever. However, I did grow up with watching not just my father, but multiple people who became police officers because they wanted to help people um, in the true essence of what it means to be a public servant. And I had my personal life interrupted many a times as we used to drive to uh, watch the UConn men's basketball team up in Hartford um, when they were horrible. Um, <laughs> and we would stop on the side of the highway because a car was broken down. And I was like, oh, here we go again. We're going to be late for the game because my father's going to make sure that they're OK on the side of the road. Um, and time after time, change a tire, make sure the tow truck comes, not just call the tow truck, but let's make sure everybody's really doing OK. Um, you know, make sure the kids are warm, all, all, everything. And so I got, I got it. When I saw that the Boston Police Department had social workers in their police stations, it actually made perfect sense <coughs> to me. Um, and I said, oh, this is really what I want to do. Um, and it was very easy for me to wrap my head around why a police department would want to have clinical social workers in its department, um, based on my own personal experience. But I also knew, and I wasn't certainly naive, um, of what it means to be 
a police officer the power. You know, Chief Cross talked about the power. The power of that uniform is huge, and it can, um, it, it means something to everybody when you see it. It depends on what you, you know, is it a negative connotation? Is it a powerful connotation? Is it a, is it a I feel safe when they're here? Um, they're going to harass me. It has a lot of power. Um, and being able to sit inside a police station um, for the first, uh, let's say, 10, 12, I don't know how long I've been the director of the program, but I was in the station for a very long time. I was in Mattapan, I was in the sexual assault unit, I was in the gang unit. Um, I've supervised a couple different stations in Dorchester, um, the school police unit. It's a very interesting dynamic to work with the kids and families that we do. We're talking about young people who they are gang involved, they are struggling with mental illness, they are not going to school. If they are in school, they're not on grade level. Um, they're coming from homes where it's multi-generational involved in state systems, um, but they're amazing. And they want the help. You don't have to work with us, it's voluntary. And they want help and um, the police officers really do like knowing, I never thought about officer frustration before, but officers really do like knowing that when they encounter young people out on the street who need help and the officers feel better, which why would we even think about how the officers feel, but feel better knowing that they're social workers who actually can help because the police officers are not equipped to help people in those scenarios. Um, but then we also see the other sides of the police officers. My staff see their police officers and their stations more than they see me. and so the behind the scenes view that we hold with law enforcement and these young people who, yeah, they're, they're hurting people. They've been hurt and they're hurting people um, who are being oppressed in every single way, who are distrustful of adults because they're teenagers and young adults and that's what people do, but they've been burnt by systems and feel like they don't have any hope. Um, so to hold their hope and to see this officer beyond his or her uniform is a very powerful, amazing experience that myself, myself and my staff get to see every day. Um, and when the chief was talking, I was thinking, I really want to find, and to watch him run off to go deal with an officer who shot is, um, is typical. I mean, he's responding to every scene, whether he needs to or not. Clearly an officer shot is something pretty rare in our city, but he, uh, the chief responds um, in lots of scenarios um, just to be on scene and know the importance of what it means to be on scene for him as the chief. Um, it's, I think about how do we make sure that the next commissioner, that the next chief, that all the recruits and cadets and the folks in the academy and the new sergeants and the new lieutenants and the new detectives really embrace the values that I think um, are trying to be put in place right now and that the narrative keeps changing and doesn't um, revert back to how it used to be and trying to figure out what role um, we all play in that, um, not just as social workers, but as members of our communities um, as adults, making sure that we're standing up for the rights of kids um, who don't have as much of a say. Um, every time I hear the chief talk, my head is spinning lots of different ways, so I'm going to stop right <laughs> there. Um, just some, one more thing. So I'm so glad the chief, because it really is kind of my thing, um, mentioned the private sector, because I really want to always encourage us to be encouraging and pushing and nudging and calling up all of our friends who work in corporate America that they need to be part of the solution as well. Um, the check is great. We'll always take the, we will always take the check at Youth Connect. Um, however, they can do much more um, than just um, give money. They can be part of the solution. They can um, think about their hiring practices and who they're willing to hire. Um, they can think about what type of opportunities they want to give to young kids to have jobs, um, to try out an internship, to be willing to host meetings with kids in Roxbury that I work with. I've never been to a 54th floor of any building downtown, and I still look out of the 54th floor of any building downtown with amazement and wonder, and like, wow, you're up 54 floors, this is pretty cool. Um, what is that like when you're 12 and 13, and imagine that you can be a 10 minute T ride away from that? Um, 
So I was really encouraged to hear the chief talk about the private sector and the role that they play right now, but I'm hoping that they will continue to play even a deeper role um, in what we're all trying to accomplish. Thank you.